Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, please, um, I know the, the tradition is to post questions in the chat and please uh, feel utterly free to do that. But, you know, I would also really welcome people just unmuting themselves and ask, inter interrupting and asking questions. Um, it just is so reassuring to know that, that there's at least someone listening to me. Um, and, uh, and so, and the other thing I want to say before I get started is I want to introduce um, Jason Rocks. Um, Jason? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Jason uh, was a graduate student with me when he did all the work that I'm going to talk about. And he's now a postdoc with Pankaj Mehta at BU. And he's absolutely terrific. And I, what I should have done was ask him to give the tutorial. I didn't think of that in time. Uh, but what I've asked him to do is answer the questions for the tutorial um, so, so that uh, he has a chance to, to talk about his work. All right, so um, the way I decided to divide this up is I'm going to talk in the tutorial about uh, more, really get a little bit more into the weeds on uh, using persistent homology. Um, and I'm gonna use it um, to, for a specific uh, problem, which is flow allosteric. I'll explain what that is in a moment. And in the actual research talk, I'm going to concentrate on mechanical allosteric, which is, uh, you know, inspired by proteins. Okay. Um, so uh, what is, oh, and I should say also, this was done in collaboration, especially all the flow allosteric was done with uh, Eleni Katafori um, and also the persistent homology analysis. So um, this came about um, because, um, uh, the, uh, I think Jason was actually giving a group meeting talk about uh, work on tuning allosteric, mechanical allosteric, and Eleni said, oh, you know, the brain does the same thing in flow networks. So the idea of that is that, you know, you have blood flow, this is a picture of the brain vasculature, uh, you have blood flow coming in through the arteries. So you have a large pressure drop across the, you know, the input, uh, which are the arteries, um, and then, depending on what you're doing, different parts of your brain need more oxygen. So right now, my speech cortex needs more oxygen. And so my brain is directing more blood flow to my speech cortex, okay? Uh, you know, if I started walking, it would need direct blood flow to a different place. So it does this on demand, okay? And it does this by contracting and dilating blood vessels to do that. And so what we can view that as is it is changing the conductances of the edges of this vascular network, okay, in order to direct extra blood flow or a large pressure drop to target locations. So, um, so how do we study this? Okay, you can study this in real vascular networks, but um, what we wanted to do was we wanted to understand this question, which is how does tuning the resistances or conductances at the microscopic edge scale, okay, actually lead to what I'm, I'm gonna call this flow allosteric at the macroscopic scale. And the reason why I call it flow allosteric is because you're putting in this, a large pressure drop at the source, at the arteries, okay? And you're directing a blood flow, extra blood flow to a target, which is often far away, okay? Else, somewhere else in, in the vascular network. Okay, so this, this getting this large local response somewhere far away is analogous to allosteric proteins. Okay, and so we call it flow allosteric. So what we do is we just make networks, disordered networks. And here's an example of one. This is with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, you can also do it with free boundary conditions. Um, and uh, and, or, or uh, yeah, uh, on a finite network. Um, and the idea is uh, we put in a pressure drop, a large pressure drop at the source. We're gonna just call that one, okay? And this is just a linear network of resistors. I can think about it in an electrical context, context is putting a voltage drop across the source node and uh, having a bunch of resistors, right? It's the same problem. So I have 
a bunch of pipes here that carry flow. There's a pressure drop here. I have a pressure drop at the target, which is initially, in this case, 0 0.003 compared to the source, which is one. Okay, so tiny pressure drop at the target. And then what we do is we tune these networks. I'll say a little bit more about that in the second half, how we do that. But we tune the conductance of these three network to achieve a target pressure drop that's greater than or equal to, in this case, 0.2, okay? So I'm just gonna show you the process. We're tuning the conductances. The, the ones in blue dashed lines are the ones that have reached their minimal value and effectively are removed from the system. These are, you know, so. Um, so uh, uh, Andrea, can I ask a clarification question, please? Yes, uh, please. Sorry, to inter sorry to interrupt. Is there, a, is there a time limit within which you want the pressure drop to get to a certain value? Or? Uh, yeah, we don't do this. This is not dynamics. It's just a, this is the static, you know, steady state response. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, just to show you, as we tune this network, as we're tuning the conductances, okay, uh, these are the plus and minus symbols are the pressures on the nodes. And you see the pressure drop at the target across these two target nodes. Is getting larger and larger as we go, and it does eventually reach that target value of 0.2. Okay, and so now we can do this for thousands of networks, right? We can just start out with thousands of different networks, and we can tune them to have the same desired target pressure drop. Um, and then we can ask, okay, so how does tuning resistances at the scale lead to allosteria at the macroscopic scale? So uh, when you don't know what to do, right, it's always useful to start by looking at extreme limits. And, uh, and so here's the extreme limit for the flow network. If you want all of the pressure drop across the source to be communicated at the target, okay, then what you need to do is you need to remove a whole line of edges that connect the, the target. So the, the blue ones are the ones with high pressure drops these, they're the same as these blue dash ones, or the blue dash ones are uh, uh, contain these, okay? And these are the ones that are removed, okay? Um, and they separate the system into two pieces, essentially, okay? The, the piece inside, the, pressure, the pressures on the nodes are minus a half. For the ones on the outside, okay, the pressure is plus a half. And because the two target nodes span the boundary between these two regions, okay, uh, the pressure drop here is one, okay? And here's a different system, okay? Similar placement of source and target. Also wanted, also the desired pressure drop of one here at the target, and it does it in a different way, right? Uh, it's a different system, but again, with periodic boundary conditions, you see it has broken the network into two pieces. So um, the other thing you can see right away is that it doesn't matter whether it was this line of edges that was removed or some other line, right? Um, it doesn't matter what the shape of, of this, the boundary between these two sectors are. The important thing is that it broke into two sectors and the source and target nodes span those sectors, okay? And that tells you that this is a topological thing, right? First of all, I went from one network to two pieces. Okay, that's counting, that's topology. And secondly, it didn't depend on the geometry of the boundary. Okay, so, um, so that's the extreme case, but we're not interested in the extreme case, right? We're interested in a case where the target can be much smaller than that. Can we still figure out what's happening? Um, and this is where persistent homology comes in because this was developed by mathematicians in order to be able to discern topological features when there's a lot of noise, okay? Um, Andrea, and, do you want mind one other question? Yeah. Um, this is Howard Stone. I, I don't understand, it doesn't sound I'm missing something physically. If the system partitions into two regions of constant pressure, there's no flow in either region because it's a constant pressure. Yeah, I can answer But I, I thought the point was to have a, I thought the point was to have a flow from one place, or I understood maybe incorrectly that the idea was to have a flow from the source to the other place. 
the idea is to have a pressure the pressure drop. But Jason, please. But but is that does that mean a flow there, from one place to another place? There, there, the two solutions are basically the same. Like if you were to tune the like try to increase the pressure at the target or increase the current at the target, there you bet you get basically the same network. In this case. What you could do is so in this case the network is split into two pieces so there is no flow from one sector to the other but if i just took one edge and just placed it between the target nodes then 100 percent of the flow that input is input into the system would be uh, uh put through well uh, would go from that, one that, to the other. okay Th thank you so i didn't mean that's, exactly, that's exactly right. so they're yeah, thank almost, you. I'm they're, sorry. Not, they're not exactly the same problem but they're very very close and okay. this sorry, is, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. No, no, it's a great question. Yeah. yeah. It's a subtle point. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I have one more question. So yeah. is the flow within each sector minimized after uh, it reaches the extreme value? Is the what? Is the flow within each sector between two nodes? Like let's say two minuses over here. Uh, is the flow between uh, two nodes minimized after uh, like the, the extreme is reached? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, right. So um, in this case, right, um, the topological, you know, in, if it's less extreme, the system doesn't actually break into two pieces. Okay. So it's not as if it has broken into two pieces, but you can't tell because there's a lot of noise or it's hard to tell because there's a lot of noise. In this case, it hasn't actually broken up into two pieces, but can we still use that to identify sectors like this where we have nearly constant node pressures, okay? And of course, I'm telling you about this. Oh, and this reference is not up to date. Sorry about that, um, but it comes later. Um, uh, yeah, it does, it does actually work. So, so, so here's again the extreme case. I have my source nodes and my target nodes, okay? And I have my two sectors in different colors. And if I look at, of course, the mean pressure in this sector, the nodes all have a, um, pressure minus a half and in this sector, they all have plus a half. And if I look at the mean pressure in this and the mean pressure in this part of the distribution, right, and take the difference, that is exactly the pressure difference that I tuned in. Okay, so uh, now if we look at uh, a less extreme case where we tune to a pressure drop of 0.2 at the target, as I showed you in, in that uh, animation, um, and we look at the mean, the, at the distribution of no pressures in the orange and in the green sector. So the point is that persistent homology analysis gives us these sectors. Once we have the sectors, we can look at the no pressures within each sector. Okay, and the difference between these is 0.29, which is actually quite close to the, the pressure drop that was tuned in. Because remember, we just wanted a pressure drop that was greater than or equal to 0.2. And the same thing for the case of uh, uh, a, a desired pressure drop of even as small as 0 0.05. Okay, again, the difference between these is very close to the actual tuned in pressure. And this works even if we have one source and many targets. Okay, so here I have six different targets. Okay, uh, and you see that the system divides into several sectors so that each target node spans two of these sectors. Okay, and again, we can read out the, the actual pressures of the target nodes from these distributions. Um, so these are just, you know, of course, examples. How do you know that I'm not just picking my data and this is just to show averages over uh, thousands of networks. So this shows for a single target edge that the, the difference of the, the means from the two sectors, the mean pressures of the two sectors, okay, uh, versus the actual pressure difference that was tuned in at the targets is very close to this dashed line, which is one, okay, which is then being the same. Okay. Uh, and this is true for different system sizes and for different numbers of targets. Okay. So that works. All right. So this works. So now let me show you how, how, what we're actually doing. Okay. Uh, since this is a tutorial, I thought it was worthwhile going into the guts of this a bit. So, um, so the idea is the following we've got a, a source. 
our source here and we've got our targets here. Okay. And uh, what you do is you order your edges, okay, from the lowest pressure drop to the highest. Okay, so zero here is the edge with the smallest pressure drop, one is the next smallest, etc. Okay, and now imagine just adding these in. So I first have the zero, okay, edge, I add that in. I'm going to just add them in an order. Then I add the first one, okay, and it's connected to the zeroth one. Then I add the second one, it's connected to the first one. So this is, these are all connected together. But now if I look, the next one is edge three and it's not connected to these, okay? So that starts out a new, what's called connected component, okay? And you keep adding edges and then you see that I add four, okay? That's not connected again. But once I add six, it connects four to three. Four is now connected to three. And so that means that the connected component that started when I added three, okay, that was born when I added three, died when I, sorry, yeah, died when I added, uh, sorry, the connected component that was born when I added edge four, died when I added edge six, okay? So, um, so that gives me a, a pair of pressure drops. The pressure drop when I, corresponding to edge four was where where the, the previous one, this purple one was born. And then it died when I added six, it was added because it joined the three cluster. Okay. Uh, and that, and I have this pair of numbers. Okay. Um, and you just keep track of that. Okay. So eventually when, you know, you, uh, the, the, the one that was introduced at three doesn't die until you add pressure, the uh, edge 15, et cetera. Okay. So you just keep track of that and, and you have what's called a birth death diagram. So on this axis, you plot where it was born. On this axis, you plot where it, was, where it died and the, the one that I pointed out where it was born at edge four and died at edge six, then it's there, okay? And you can do the same thing in reverse. You can start with the highest pressure drop, okay? Put that down first and then the next highest, next and so forth. So you now go down from the top, so that's called this is called filtration. So we can start with filtration from the bottom. We can do filtration from the top. And when we start at the top and go down, the births, you know, are uh, uh, higher than the deaths. Okay. And and so we end up adding points in, in the bottom diagonal of this block. Okay. So um, so now you got a bunch of birth death diagrams. Okay, what do you do with those? Well, the idea is that, um, first of all, that features that are topologically significant are ones that are born and survive for a long time before they die. So they're far off from the diagonal, okay? Um, if it's just noise, then they could be born and die right away, okay? So, so those are near the diagonal. Um, but, we do something else. Yeah. Question? Yes. Um, so uh, from what I understand, the graph is not when they were born or died, but it's um, the pressure at which they were the pressure born. Drop, the pressure drop corresponding to the edge. Where that would, yeah. Where but I were. guess because they're in order, that would make them. That's right. They're, okay. Exactly. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. So um, on that, Oops. Um, on that, uh, the life death diagram that you had, I saw there was a point below the diagonal. Um, does that mean that the, the death points uh, below the birth point? Um, so Right, that's because for the red points, I'm starting at the top and going down. Gotcha. So okay. I'm repeating the whole process, starting with the, the highest pressure drop edge, this one. Okay, and then going down. So 22, 21, 20. Okay. And that's why it's born and then it dies at a, a, at a higher value than when it dies. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. So if you just look at individual birth death diagrams, they're, they're extremely noisy and you can't tell much. Okay. So here's the thing. What we did was here's the advantage of having thousands of networks, okay, that are tuned to the same 
uh, target pressure drop because now we can compare what happens for the untuned system and for one that was tuned to have a target pressure drop of at least 0.8. And what you see is, huh, there is this really big difference. And in particular, you see this line here at 0.8, okay, for the downwinds filtration, okay, where they were all born at 0.8. And there's this other one, okay, um, where they extend up to 0.8 where these points extend up to 0.8, okay? And so, huh, we're seeing something about the function that we tuned in in this birth death diagram. Um, so, uh, do I have that? Oh, uh, what was this? Oh yeah, right. So, so the point is that, um, so what this is saying is that when we're going up, we're doing the ascending filtration, Okay, there are networks with many basins that are born at a pressure drop of zero. Okay, in other words, they have uniform node pressures and they persist all the way up to the target strength. That's, that's this line here. Okay, and then on the descending, I see I have the same information here, sorry. On the descending filtration, okay, the, the, the two networks have many sort of mountaintops, okay, uh, with a pressure drop, uh, which is, uh, the target pressure drop, okay? And, and so what are these? So, so these, the, on the ascending things, these are what will eventually lead to sectors, but that I have all these basins. On the descending ones, what we're finding are the cracks between these, these things, okay? The cracks between the sectors. Um, so there is this direct, correspondence, you know, to, to the physics. Um, and if you now look at networks that are tuned to different thresholds, okay, you see this really is general. So that this is ordered by color, right? So one is yellow and so forth. And you see these lines, okay, that appear at the tuned pressure drop, okay, on and for the descending filtration, and in the ascending filtration, you see again, the color variation tells you that it, it extends all the way up to the, the, the tuned in target value. So this is, this is really general, okay? For a you know, huge, over this range of tuning thresholds. Okay, so there's one problem, which is that now let's, let's, look, at, let's look at the basins, okay? These basins here, for example, that appear here. These are, okay. Um, if you look at, at these, okay, these are the basins of nearly uniform node pressure then that appear from doing this, there are a lot of them, okay? Um, and so not just two. So, so what we do next is we introduce a coarse graining step, okay? So if you now just look in real space, let's just take a cut across this, okay? Um, uh, then, Okay, yeah, take a cut across this, and then you can drop plot, you know, the pressure drop across the edge is a function of where the, the edge is, and you would have a landscape like this, right? And these are all the different basins, okay? And the idea is what we do is we just go in and start with the smallest barrier between the basin and smooth it out, okay? And we just keep doing that until they are smoothed out, until the two target nodes, the last point at which the two target nodes are in different sectors. In other words, if I just get rid of one more barrier, the two target nodes will be in the same sector. Okay. At that point, we have what we call our primary basins. Okay. And uh, those are, in fact, the sectors that we have. Oh, this just shows that coarse grain step of taking that barrier and ironing it out. Okay. Until we do this. All right. So, um, so that's how we get these sectors. Okay. Um, so just to sum up, I just want to say persistent homology is this wonderful tool that allows us to find these significant topological features. Um, but just the birth that diagram of single network in itself is not useful. Okay. What allowed us to do this was that we had ensembles of networks with the same function. And to get those ensembles, you know, we had to be able to tune the network. We had to be able to create those ensembles. But once we did that and we tuned the value of delta 
to these different values, then we could see, aha, these are the features that we need to focus on. Um, and the other thing is that the topological features that come from the birth death diagram, even though they're significant, they're not in themselves useful. We still needed to coarse grain to see the sectors. Okay, so uh, that's the end of the tutorial part. Um, so I don't, do we have time for questions? Or? Yeah, so thanks, Andrea. We have a few minutes for questions, maybe, maybe three minutes. Um, and there's one question in the chat because I think most people are just asking them. Um, but the question in the chat asks uh, to clarify, is the adjusted network broken up by considering regions with similar pressure within uh, Delta as having uniform pressure? Uh, so I'm not sure. Yeah, it's not gonna give these questions. J Jason's gonna take these questions. Yeah. And we welcome more questions coming in, um, even if we don't have time for them right now. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just having a hard time understanding this question. Whoever asked it, could you clarify? Would you mind clarifying a little bit, if you don't mind? Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so my understanding is that uh, there are these two pressure differences in this graph, um, and then the conductance along the edges is adjusted to um, uh, match those pressure differences. Um, I'm still, uh, I'm a bit confused about how you go from those adjusted conductances to this um, case where the some edges are removed. Thanks. Oh, okay. So yeah, Andrew, so Andrew, is, I think is gonna talk about this a little bit more in the- uh... Uh, yeah, the design part. How do we design the networks to get the desired pressure drop? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that in the next half. But to summarize, we just, we just, we do, we, it's just, so we perform a little bit of an optimization uh, procedure where we start with our initial network. We look at the response that it gives us at the target and we see, we measure how close it is to whatever the desired response is. And then we optimize the conduct, the conductances of the edges to give us our desired response. And then if the conductive of an edge just numerically goes to zero, we just say that it's been removed. Um, okay, thank you. Let me see. Uh, so then the next question was, was the dashed line in the birth death plot the, uh, for the random case? For the same network, uh, so I think you can. Which one? Do you mean uh, the, the, oh this this for dash line here? I oh yes, know. yes. Sorry. Uh, for the same network, the dash line is just for reference. So basically, the idea is that features. So when you perform persistent homology on something, you get a bunch of features out, and each feature is characterized by this pair of points. Just saying, basically, just whatever the value of the function is when it first appeared and then the value of the function when it disappeared. And then uh, the idea is that this dashed line are corresponds to features that have very low significance. So they just kind of appear and then immediately disappear. So, you know, in that case, you know, it, when, when Andrea showed this, uh, this little landscape, uh, landscape cross section, this would correspond to like the little tiny wrinkles in the landscape. You would, I mean, if you saw those, you wouldn't really think they're that important. And the idea is then points that are really far away from this diagonal line are much more significant. So those big, you know, large scale basins that uh, that she showed would correspond to this, for example, this blue point that's really far from the diagonal. So it appears early on and then it lasts for a really long time when you perform this algorithm. And so you'd say it's more significant. I see, thank you. Also, on the ascending filtration, when you're going up, all the points have to be to the left of the dash line, and on the descending one, they have to be to the right of the dash line. Yeah. Yeah. 